thanks Courtney forgot to do that before so shall I um just go through that again for the recording might as well yeah if it's recording now can you quickly do a, a quick thing of that that was brilliant sure so um Miles Bernier who was one of the pioneers of uh the Anglophone revival of ancient philosophy apparently said that it was very important to take note of the very first word of uh, Plato's dialogues. And here in the Gorgias, the very first word is polemo, polemo kaimakes. And of course, polemo means something to do with a conflict, a battle, a struggle. And that's a significant marker that we're going to meet with some conflict later on. Although we don't actually find that straight away. We, we've got this slightly um, chaotic opening where Chirophon and Socrates have been held up in the Agora. They've missed out on Gorgias' great presentation, his public, public appearance. But Callicles, who, at whose home Gorgias is staying, says that's no problem. Uh, Gorgias will do a private presentation just for Socrates and Chirophon. And Chirophon is the one that we know about from the Apology, uh, who Socrates memorably says is a bit of a crazy man. He's loyal. He's enthusiastic he went to Delphi to ask was there anyone wiser than Socrates and the answer of course came back that no one was wiser than Socrates which which meant a puzzle that, that Socrates had to work over but I don't know about you but Chirophon is a bit chaotic he's a bit enthusiastic he's loyal he's loving and I love him because he's such a great friend of Socrates so that's where we are in this um, interesting opening to the dialogue hi Kyle Oh, maybe here, but he's not here. <laughs> so anyway, how, how did... Oh, there he is. Hi, Carl. Hi. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a bit late. That's okay. So how did, how did you um, kind of react to this opening and, and this kind of to and fro that we have to begin with? Oh, it's good. You know, it's classic kind of Plato, isn't it? And... Uh, Yeah, so that, and then it comes, there's a bit of a toing and froing about whether Gorgias is going to talk with Chirophon or whether, and then Polis gets involved. So Polis, um, as we've seen in the, in the notes, um, means a cult, a young, again, another young and enthusiastic type person who, uh, who's happy to take control and, and start the discourse. So there's some talk, isn't there, about uh, Gorgias has already just made a speech to a, a crowd and they've arrived late, and, uh, but Socrates and Chirophon get invited in to hear a speech, maybe, if they're lucky, by Gorgias, and he says something like, um, um, I will answer any question that any person here puts to me. Is, is that kind of how? I think that's the opening too, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And in fact, he says, <laughs> he says nobody's asked him any new questions for a long time um, because he's, he's used to making these public appearances. And of course, I think public speakers get this a lot, that they tend to get a whole lot of the same questions over and over again. So the, the first question that gets addressed here in section 448 uh, is, is what, um, what, what Gorgias is, is really about, what, it, what he does for a living, what his job is, what his profession is. And, this, and Socrates, um, you know, is asking that question up front. And he says, an excellent idea, ask him Chirophon. Chirophon says, ask him what? Socrates, what he is. Chirophon says, what do you mean? Socrates, well, if he were a maker of shoes, he'd answer that he was a cobbler, wouldn't he? Or, or don't you see what I mean? And so um, Chirophon takes on the role of questioning. But then, first of all, as I say, Polis uh, wants to answer on behalf of Gorgias. And so the first point that um, Chirophon says is, well, suppose that Gorgias were knowledgeable in his brother Herodicus's part. What would be the right name for us to call him then? Isn't it the same one as his brother's? Yes, it is. So we'll be right in saying he's a doctor. And this comes up again later as what um, Gorgias's brother Herodicus does. He's, he's a, a medical professional. Uh, then if he were experienced in the craft of Ariston, the son of Aglaophon or his brother, then he'd be a painter. So uh, if he's knowledgeable in a craft, what is it? And so then Polis, and here we're on the, near the top of page 794 in our PDF, 
Paulus gives this nice little speech. He says, many among men are the crafts experientially devised by experience, Carafa. He's a little bit pompous for a, for a young cult, is our Paulus. Our Gorgias is indeed in this group. He partakes of the most admirable of the crafts. But he's not really, uh, Paulus and Gorgias aren't really answering the question. So then about halfway down that page, oh, sorry, halfway down 794, Socrates says, well, no one has asked you what Gorgias' craft is like, but what craft it is and what one ought to call, ought to call Gorgias. And he finishes by saying, rather, Gorgias, why don't you tell us yourself what the craft you are knowledgeable in is and hence was what we're supposed to call you. So that's, in the, that's at 449A, halfway down that page. And here Gorgias finally comes in and speaks for himself. He says, it's oratory, Socrates. So we're supposed to call you an orator? Yes, and a good one, Socrates, if you really want to call me what I boast myself to be, as Homer puts it. So, and then Gorgias admits that the claim he makes and the reason he gets paying students coming to him or their parents are prepared to pay is that he's capable of making others orators as well. And, and that's an important point, I think. It's not merely that he gives speeches, but he's also able to train people to give speeches. It's a right. point that comes up uh, as the dialogue progresses. Um, Carl, you said you're having trouble hearing. Is that intermittent or is it? Um, I got I got the phone volume up uh, full, but um, I can't seem to hear everything. Uh, it's, uh, okay. it's all right. Carry on. I'm not sure quite what we can do about that, but fingers crossed. There's a, there's a bit of a cacophony, and I I don't have aircon in this room. I've just got this fan here, so uh, that's that's that may have something. Yeah, it's pretty warm. Okay, so then we get the question of well, wh what's oratory all about? Um, I thought it was really interesting here too. This is on page 795 in our PDF. When Socrates says, do you give me a presentation of this very thing, the short style of speech and leave the long style for some other time? And Gorgias says, yep, I'm going to do that. You'll say you've never heard anyone make shorter speeches. And that becomes quite a theme, I think, later in the dialogue. And, in fact, Gorgias is quite concise uh, at times. And also Socrates can be quite prolix at times and make quite long speeches himself. So that becomes a bit of a, an issue about it. But what, what is this craft, this techne, this, this, this um, profession that Gorgias is involved in? Uh, so Socrates uh, makes an analogy. Well, weaving is concerned with making clothes. Music is concerned with making tunes. Uh, and what kind of speeches does Gorgias make? You know, he, um, does he make speeches that explain how sick people are going to get well? Well, not really, no. Um, but medicine also, you know, involves speeches about how to get well. Uh, and physical training. So a gym, a gym instructor would talk, you would have a lot of speeches about how people to train properly. So at the top of page 796, um, basically Socrates concludes, well, every other craft or profession is concerned with speeches that are relevant to that particular skill. So why aren't they oratory? What is it that Gorgias is doing differently? And Gorgias says, the reason, Socrates, is that in the case of the other crafts, the knowledge consists almost completely in working with your hands and activities of that sort. In the case of oratory, on the other hand, there isn't any such manual work. Its activity and influence depend entirely on speeches. That's the reason I consider the craft of oratory to be concerned with speeches, and I say that I'm right about this. So, but we know that Socrates isn't going to be <laughs> entirely convinced by that. And it's kind of funny too because uh, growing up, 
as an ochre Australian, my dad was a farmer and that sort of stuff, you would often meet academics who would give you the impression that their their academic knowledge was of the greatest of human concerns and people who worked with their hands were kind of dullards, you know? So I think that's, it's like a perennial kind of attitude that gets raised here because Gorgias even says that the orator is concerned with the greatest of human concerns and the best. That's right. Absolutely, yeah. So, but Socrates obviously isn't content with that definition. Uh, and so, in fact, at, towards the bottom of that page, in this section 451, <laughs> then Socrates goes on to make quite a large speech. Come on, then, please complete your answer in the terms of my question. Since oratory is one of those crafts which mostly uses speech, and since there are also others of that sort, try to say what it is that oratory, which exercises its influence through speeches, is about. And he uses the example of arithmetic, mathematics. Well, that has speeches. People who are teaching mathematics have to use speeches. Um, people who uh, are teaching a number of skills like that, or astronomy is another one. Well, somebody who's teaching astronomy has to use speeches and influence their students. But that's not oratory, that's astronomy. So what is it that is different about oratory? And as you say, Courtney, halfway down the page um, 797, Gorgias comes out with it's the greatest of human concerns and the best. In the Greek, it says, Tamegista ton anthropeon pragmaton kai arista, which is kind of, it's all very concise, you know, he says it very, um, in, a, in a very short span. But then again, Socrates is the one who goes on to make a significant speech, you know, and he's not the professional orator. Gorgias is the world famous orator, but it's Socrates who, who um, takes things at more length. And so he said, Socrates points out that, well, the doctor and the um, gym trainer would also think that their particular concerns were the most important. You know, what could be more important than good health? That's what the doctor and the gym trainer do for us. And so that brings us to the, oh, even a financial expert, you know, as somebody who's uh, a financial advisor and accountant, well, they think their concern is the most important for people. And so he says, come on, Gorgias, consider yourself questioned by both these men and myself and give us your answer. What is this thing that you claim is the greatest good for humankind, a thing that you claim to be a producer of? It really puts him on the spot. And so that finally flushes Gorgias out into actually uh, defining what it is that he thinks he's doing. The Gorgias says, the thing that is in actual fact the greatest good, Socrates, it is the source of freedom for humankind itself. And at the same time, it is for each person the source of rule over others in one city. What is this thing you're referring to? I'm referring to the ability to persuade by speeches, judges in a law court, councillors in a council meeting, an assemblyman in an assembly or in any other political gathering that might take place. In point of fact, with this ability, you'll have the doctor for your slave and the physical trainer too. And for this financial expert of yours, he'll turn out to be making more money for somebody else instead of himself. For you, in fact, if you've got the ability to speak and to persuade the crowds. So that is what Gorgias' skill comes down to. It's the skill of persuasion. Well, Perthan in Greek, which it kind of occurred to me, and I don't know what you think of this, Kyle, or, or it, you know, in regard to the Greek, but it occurred to me that it's translated as persuasion, but we could also translate it as influencing. And, you know, that's a verb that our, <laughs> that our generations today are right across. Uh, everybody knows what is involved in influencing. It's, it's getting people to buy stuff, do stuff, uh, particularly buy stuff, but you know, what, whatever you think is, is, is right for them to do. So I think Socrates, uh, for Gorgias, in fact, is king of the influences. I think that, uh, that... That segues really nicely into a comment I want to make about that section, if that's all right. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> I remember in Leotard, he wrote that postmodern self. He's a, obviously a post-structuralist, but he talks about Plato's interest in the role of the legislator. And this kind of post-structuralist critique is often picked up in the critical school of psychology, for example. 
and they will say things like um, that that for example um, the use of uh, like the diagnostic and statistical manual for diagnosing mental illness is a form of social control and and the psychiatrists take on the role of legislators so what i just want to sort of point out here is that Although Plato and um, others going on and probably uh, inspired by this sort of text will be concerned with how we rule over ourselves, like the Stoics, or how institutions and discourses interact to shape the status quo. So that's a very Foucauldian kind of analysis of the same topic. So I think it's really like exactly what you're saying, very prescient to point to influences as very um, modern form of the same kind of uh, system of of status quo shaping and all that sort of thing, and obviously it highlights the same the same concerns that that uh, Socrates has about um, Gorgias. That are they doing it for the the good of the people, um, benefiting the soul of the city, or or are they just doing it to have power over others? So yeah, I just thought that would be an interesting point to to notice yeah totally Courtney thanks for that and of course when we if we think about influence well influence can be used for a good purpose or it can be used for a bad purpose and and that's exactly what Socrates point is in a way that uh it, you know it, it, it's context dependent as to as to whether it's a good thing or not so that, and that's why he uh he then goes on to say uh, you should know that I'm convinced I'm one of the people who, in a discussion with someone else, really want to have knowledge of the subject the discussion's about, because that's kind of critical. Um, you can know for sure that I don't know what this persuasion derived from oratory that you're talking about is, or what subjects it's persuasion about. So we get this idea that it's kind of context relevant. Um, if you want to know what kind of a painter Zeuxis is, well, what sort of pictures does he paint? Um, if you want to know what, uh, uh, you know, if you want to know about an orator, what else do we need to know about him? Uh, so again, we come back to this idea of what, what is this persuasion, this influence? And uh, as Socrates says, halfway down page 799, he concludes, well, oratory isn't the only producer of persuasion. So again, that brings us back to this key issue. Well, what on earth is Gorgias uh, doing in his profession? So Gorgias likes to imagine that he's uh, very influential in contexts such as law courts, uh, large gatherings, and, it's, and he also comes out and says it's concerned with those matters that are just and unjust. So that's interesting that Gorgias himself comes out with that. It's not Socrates. Um, so, of course, in context to do with law courts and government decision-making in general, we have an issue about what's just or unjust. And, and on that point, I think about why Gorgias is doing this in part is because right from the outset, Socrates made a point of saying that he has a preference for discussion rather than listening to persuasive speeches. And as you said, to keep the answers as short as possible. So he's really fallen for Socrates' trap, really. He's already involved in a, in a discussion or a dialectic as opposed to what he would prefer to be doing, where he would be in charge. And later on, that's how Polis keeps getting caught out because Socrates keeps telling him off and not doing it right. You know? So I think yeah. Socrates is very clever because the dialectic in its Alenkus has a specific kind of uh, ability to stop people from wandering off and kind of really define their terms and narrow down what the discussion is so that it can pursue um clarity and uh, and a kind of collaborative um seeking of the truth or something like that yeah and we get the sense that gorgias was kind of he was only in like second year to be go to be starting with because he didn't actually think that he would be put on the spot you know he he thought this was just going to be a very informal kind of chit chat but now here he is actually having to um bring all his He's eventually going to have to get up to top gear and bring all his rhetorical skills to bear. 
which he didn't kind of expect. Because I think uh, at that um, time there, Socrates was also interesting to ask him for his um, like the persuasion and the influence. Was that out, out of um, true or, or false conviction or knowledge? And I think the big difference also is when you influence, there is a big difference. Like if you influence out of conviction or out of knowledge, and it's a big, big difference. Because uh, obviously, the, I mean, for for him, I, for uh, I don't know how you pronounce him again. Go go just. You know, he he's more into the conviction is enough. Where I would think that you know Socrates is more into you you can't be a an orator without the knowledge of of what you talk about type of thing. And, and I think Socrates in 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 all the the discussion there, I'm I'm amazed that he he's always positive. And in a way, but he he's always putting the other one down, you know, in a way, you know, like, a, but nicely, you know, he's um like a bit like fathering, you know, um into, you know, telling him how to act and, you know, and, and con I, I think it's um difficult to follow, you know, like the questioning each time, but uh, conviction and knowledge, I thought that was interesting. Anyway, oh, sorry. That's a, no, 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 that's no. that's a really key point, Isabel. Thanks for bringing it up, and that's one that Shannon brought up in the in the um, Facebook group, and I thought <laughs> thought he'd be here to talk about it tonight. But yeah, no, it's absolutely key. Just about that point too, where you felt like Socrates was sort of being a bit paternalistic or something. I I kind of got the feeling right at the outset, though, that Gorgias and his team were very smug and arrogant, and that was kind of what set them up in the beginning for a bit of a fall, because yeah. Gorgias is saying, well, by the way, I'm the best, you know, I'm really good at this. <laughs> and That's he's right. kind of putting himself in a situation. He's got a whole crowd around him that he's been saying, well, I can answer any question any of you guys ask me. And then <laughs> he gets he's someone... He's really sick of getting all these old old questions you know you just want something new please, please. But, but that's how socrates works so well because he's <laughs> he's giving them compliments he's just yeah. like each time the answer is yes 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 you know like yes i'm the best yeah you understand me yeah i couldn't say it any better you know <laughs> as you say he corners them <laughs> yeah it's it's beautiful to watch <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and you and you have to ask yourself too. Sorry to interrupt again, Judith, because I I caught myself reading a bit a, a bit later on, where I thought is Socrates being sarcastic or is he being sincere? Like there's there's a question there, and I think he's being sincere. I think he's trying to engage them in a discussion, and that's why later on he comes back to this thing. He's like, look, guys. I don't want you to think that I'm going after you, eh? I don't want you to think that I'm trying to win a point. What I'm trying to do is get you to have a discussion with me about the most important things. That's all I'm doing. And if you don't like it, I'll stop right now. That's what he says. And I think that's really yeah, cool. It is really cool. Absolutely. So uh, so then, yeah, as, uh, that point you brought up, Isabel, we get to that point, page 100, uh, 800, sorry. Um, what, what's the difference between being convinced of something and learning something? Well, the difference is that if you learn something, by definition, that's knowledge. Uh, whereas to be convinced of something, that may not be knowledge. And what Gorgias does is actually influence people to a point of conviction, which isn't necessarily the same thing as knowledge. Uh, and But where that becomes really important, as Socrates points out, is to do with gatherings, assemblies, law courts, concerning things that are just and unjust. And, of course, that can be to do with life and death situations. You know, it could be that somebody is facing the death penalty um, and, and they're in a law court, so we need to know. We, it's not just a matter of us, of us as a jury or onlookers being convinced of something. We need to have knowledge about it. So... Uh, I thought it was quite a key point where Socrates says, and this is section 455a, and so an orator is not a teacher of law courts and other gatherings about things that are just and unjust either, but merely a persuader or an influencer, we could say, for I don't suppose that he could teach such a large gathering about matters so important in a short time. Basically, 
yeah, that's just going to be a short time frame. So you're not actually going to get to the bottom of uh, facts about what's just and unjust in that short time frame. And Gorgias admits, he says, no, he certainly couldn't. And so then Socrates talks about these discussions that happen in the assembly uh, when the city of Athens wants to make a decision about some infrastructure, say about a new city wall or a dock or something else. Who's going to come and advise the assembly about that? Well, they're going to get someone who's specialised in those areas, someone who's an engineer uh, or uh, it's going to, if it's a decision about the war, they're going to get a general. They're going to get someone who's a specialist in that particular field. What do you say about such cases, Gorgias? Since you yourself claim both to be an orator and to make other orators, we'll do well to find out from you the characteristics of your craft. Um, so are you going to advise the city about these things, about to do with, you know, infrastructure or strategy? So that's kind of putting Gorgias on the spot, basically pointing out to him that, well, actually, you're not an expert on any of these particular fields. Um, so are you going to be the person they turn to or not? And so Gorgias <laughs> says, well, well, Socrates, I'll try to reveal to you clearly everything oratory can accomplish. You yourself led the way nicely, for you do know, don't you, that these dockyards and walls of the Athenians and the equipping of the harbour came about through the advice of Themistocles and in some cases through that of Pericles, but not through that of the craftsmen. And this is really interesting. Socrates kind of concedes the point and, and uh, gives a, a bit of autobiography in the process. He says, that's what they say about Themistocles, Gorgias. I myself heard Pericles when he advised us on the middle wall. This middle wall is, um, was between the Piraeus, the port of Athens, and, and the uh, Agora, and the points in the centre of the town. Um, and so that encourages Gorgias to go further. He says, and whenever those craftsmen, you were just now speaking of a appointment, Socrates, you see that the orators are the ones who give advice and whose views on these matters prevail. And so finally, after again, Socrates seems to concede that point to Gorgias, he then launches into his full oratory with a long talk. And he points out that when he goes to see his brother's patients, along with his brother, the doctor, sometimes he, Gorgias, can persuade them to undergo surgery or take medicine they ought to take through the power of his oratory, which his brother wasn't able to accomplish. Uh, and so he, uh, he then makes the point that uh, oratory is any, like any other competitive skill. And so if, uh, if somebody's learnt boxing or other um, martial arts, if they then turn around and attack people, well, you don't blame the teacher who taught them the martial art. That's entirely on the person who does it. And so he's kind of preemptively, <laughs> Socrates hasn't actually blamed Gorgias for, for anything, but Gorgias is preemptively um, exculpating himself for any potential um, blame out of a situation that's arising from his oratory, which is kind of weird actually in a way. It's as if he's anticipated this problem. I wondered about this. I mean, I don't know much about the backstory, so you might help me here. But I wonder if there's some kind of... I don't think it stands up, actually, but I'll just put it out there. You know, obviously, Socrates had affiliations with, like, Alcibiades and things like that. And in a way, the the teacher might have wayward students and and there is that question about how it reflects on the teacher at the end of the day i wondered if any of that was going on but it probably doesn't because i think we end up seeing that gorgias ought to be responsible in a sense for his students right i think that's a good point i hadn't thought of that but yeah i think i think alcibiades is always in the background in, in this stuff so yeah i think you're probably right i think there is a meta question there about you know how how far a teacher can be held responsible for their for their students' um, behaviour or misbehaviour. So that's a really interesting point you've raised. Thanks for that. And you know, I'm going to say something really crazy then because I just say stuff that pops into my head. 
I wonder if this, following that notion that appears later, that um, that when a man is punished or pays his dues, that he's made better for it. Following this, there's probably no grounds for this, but we'll put it out there. Maybe Socrates' own um, execution is a way of paying his dues for the wrongs that he himself committed by thinking that he could train people like Alcibiades to be virtuous in the first place. I don't know. It's pretty well, that's a really that's really interesting. I have to have to think some more about that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so he, at this point, again, kind of Socrates kind of shifts gears, and he, and this is the point that Courtney made earlier about. I think you made in the Facebook group, Courtney, about. Socrates takes a step back and says, well, you know, sometimes in this kind of situation, people are, are trying to make their own point, they get aggressive, and sometimes um, they just want to win, and it's unproductive. Uh, and so are we really in a position to pursue this, these questions? Are you this kind of man? I, I certainly want to pursue it. Um, and so uh, this, I think, harks back to that very first word of the dialogue, you know, polymo kaimakes. Socrates has got a, um, an intuition here that there's going to be conflict coming along, and this is his um, foreshadowing of it towards the rest of the dialogue, and we, we know there's going to be a lot of conflict coming along. But so he gives Gorgias, Chirophon, Polus, Callicles, all the protagonists, he gives them an out here. Um, if they don't want to pursue it, that's okay. Um, but if they're going to pursue it in good spirit, well, let's proceed. And, you know, I see another analogy as well. There's that 100%. But because I'm quite interested in the therapeutic aspect of stoicism and, and in this case, Platonism, you can see he's doing what a good therapist will do too. He's saying, I'm not here to make you defensive. I'm not here to challenge or provoke you what i'm here to do is to bring you towards a cure i'm here to help you to discover the truth and maybe that will be a collaborative project where i will be improved in the process that's what he's i think he's doing if you extend the care of the soul idea the therapeutic aspect that's 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 part of the thing yeah it's a very interesting idea So that's probably a good place to have a little um, pause and you know see if there's anything else people want to talk about. I think that that section is a really beautiful section and it's often quoted, right? Like people always talk about the what kind of man am I speech and uh, comes up a lot in different Facebook groups, for example, where it's like, well, I'm happy to be refuted like Socrates is. <laughs> I mean, I pulled it the other day. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and of course, it's more honoured in the breach and the observance, you know. Everyone says they're happy to be refuted, except when it actually happens to them. <laughs> and of course, so what's interesting is that at the top of page 803, Gorgias falls right into line. He says, oh, yes, Socrates, I say that I myself too am the sort of person you describe. And you think, well, are you just being, are you being genuine, Gorgias, or are you just doing your thing? You just you're just fitting in here because that's your role. But but what's interesting is then he says, oh, but what about all the people who've been kept waiting all this time and they've all been you know they listened to the presentation earlier. They must be really tired. Um, but if then you know dear old Chirophon just comes up and says, no, you know of course this is. I hope I'll never be so busy that I forego discussions such as this conducted in the way this one is because I find I find it more practical to do something else. And even Callicles, who's going to come up more prominently later. By the gods, Chirophon, as a matter of fact, I too, though I've been present at many a discussion before now, don't know if I've ever been so pleased as I am at the moment. So if you're willing to discuss, even if it's all day long, you'll be gratifying me. So if Gorgias had been hoping to get out of it at that point, yeah. <laughs> there's no way he's going to now. I had that feeling too. I thought that Gorgias was looking for an out or they were <laughs> providing each other that opportunity. And I made a note there too. I thought, but he's locked in given his egotistical boast to the crowd. He's kind of committed now, isn't he? 
Well, that's right. He's the, he's like this total celebrity, you know. He can't back out now. And so then he's kind of dragged dragged to the point. It'll be to my shame ever after, Socrates, if I weren't willing when I myself have made the claim that anyone may ask me anything he wants. All right. If it suits these people, carry on with the discussion and ask what you want. Okay, so that, that after that little kind of interlude, then we're right back at all the questioning. And so Socrates tries to get to the point of what this, what this influencing is, you know, what is this persuasion, this influencing, what does it involve? And when we kind of take a step back and think, well, what is influencing? How does it work? How, how do people get influenced by marketers, by um, politicians, by, by anyone? You know, what, what, is, what is it that somebody that, has? That create a, a desire in you, you know, a desire yes. of whatever it is. But I think we, we're driven by desire of, of whatever sort. So they influence you to want whatever it is, you know, that it is health or travel or the good cow or whatever power you know yeah or... and basically I had to... that you can get it <laughs> you can get your desire you know through happening right now or whatever that's right <laughs> that's influence <laughs> that, that's the role of the influencer yeah i had to write the um reasons that's well the questions that socrates gives now i had to write them down because i got a bit lost um that's the bit you're up to aren't you where Socrates asks if the orator, regarding whether he has or has not knowledge, especially about justice, for example, is it that he not know but persuades, or must he know and must the student already know, or will the teacher not teach these things because it's not his job, he's not a teacher of knowledge, um, but make it seems that he knows these things, the student, and to seem good when he isn't, or... Won't the orator be able to teach him if he doesn't already know these things? So there was a whole bunch of things that he puts out as, are you doing this? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? Which one are you doing? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and and also the context. So at the bottom of page, this page, sorry, 803, um, it depends whether there are among people who know what they're talking about. Either. You know, it's all very well to, you know, I could probably talk about health, but if I was among a, a group of doctors, well, obviously, you know, they would know that I didn't know what I was talking about, whereas I might be able to bluff somebody else. Um, that's, you know, that's the context is everything here. And as, as Socrates then goes on to say, um, at the top of page 804, the same is true about the orator and oratory relative to the other crafts too. Oratory doesn't need to have any knowledge of the state of the subject matters. It only needs to have discovered some device to produce persuasion in order to make itself appear to those who don't have knowledge, but it knows more than those who actually do have it. And so that brings us back to this question of, well, when the decisions are being made in the Athenian assembly about, you know, the infrastructure, the walls, the port, the Navy, okay, was it actually on the basis of people who knew what they were talking about or wasn't it? And so it calls all these things into question. And uh, so Gorgias kind of bluffs there. He says, well, Socrates, aren't things made very easy when you come off no worse in the craftsman, even though you haven't learnt any other craft but this one? So basically he's saying, isn't it okay if you don't get caught out? <laughs> well, okay, what if the walls collapse and the ships don't sail? But anyway, um, so. But you can see where Socrates is going with this, right? Because in a way he's like, oh, my God, you know, you guys are running around. Everyone's treating you like you're celebrities. But it's just pure chance that, you know, things go well. They might go really badly, and you'll probably blame someone else anyway. But <laughs> And his conclusion really is here, or somewhere here, that the orator doesn't have the, the good of the city in mind at all. He cares little for that. He only cares about those things he, he said before, which is, I think, um, having power over people was one of the, the kind of key things. Yeah, and it, it's kind of scary, actually, you know. So that's when Socrates, again, comes out with a rather big speech of his own. Um, is it the case that the orator is in the same position with respect to what's just and unjust, what's shameful and admirable, 
what's good and bad as he is about what's healthy about the subjects of other crafts. So he's kind of getting the nitty gritty, you know, do you actually know what you're talking about, about any of this stuff? And by the, at the end of this speech, he kind of, he's invoking Zeus. He says, yes, by Zeus, do give us your revelation and tell us what oratory can accomplish just as you just now said you would. So I think Gorgias is a bit on the back foot here. He says, well, Socrates, I suppose that if he really doesn't have this knowledge, and this is a, he's talking about a, somebody who's coming to him, so a young student whose parents are wealthy enough to send them to Gorgias. Well, Socrates, I suppose that if he really doesn't have this knowledge, he'll learn these things from me as well. And Socrates says, hold it there. You're right to say so. If you make someone an orator, it's necessary for him to know what's just and what's unjust either beforehand, well, if it was beforehand and knew it anyway, or by learning it from you afterwards. The Gorgias is happy to agree with that. And so, again, we come back to the analogies with other skills, carpentry, music, medicine. Um, and... Uh, at the bottom of page 804, and Socrates says, and by this line of reasoning, isn't a man who has learned what's just a just man too? Yes, absolutely, Gorgia says. Now, I've seen in a, a, some commentary or other a questioning of this, um, this step from Socrates. So, you know, the idea of if you know what's just, then you will be just yourself, that's probably questionable. Can we talk about that because that's something that I think has a big question mark around too. I have my own naive ideas about it, but um, Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's really important. Oh, I want to hear what you think first from your the commentary and stuff. Um, well, I mean, I haven't got into it in detail, but I think this is a place where possibly Socrates is engaging in a bit of rhetorical um argumentation himself and and trying to trip up Gorgias uh, in a way and using a somewhat dodgy argument himself. You know, I, I think it's perfectly plausible. Well, <laughs> so, and it, it, again, it's kind of come back to this idea of, of goodness being cognitive or not. So, you know, on the Socratic view, I think somebody who knows properly what just behaviour is, is is going to, is or should follow, is going to follow that. So I think that's where Socrates is coming from, but I think there would be a case to argue against that. See, my, my response to this, um, thinking about the Stoics and probably Epictetus, how he would think about this at least, as best as I know, of course, is um, something like the distinction that Socrates has already set up between conviction and knowledge. So conviction can be either true or false, but knowledge can only ever be true. You can only have true knowledge, right? And and this, again, you see in the Stoics with the catalepsis kind of argument, right? So what he's saying is, in a way, that um, to know something like justice, to have that sort of knowledge, is kind of the equivalent of saying something like, um, you know, you can't just forget what you know. You can't just forget that it's daytime when you see the sun in the sky because the truth, and this is Socrates' kind of thing, is that we're all lovers of truth and we cannot deny the truth as it appears to us to be. And so if we have knowledge, like catalepsis, we have the true knowledge of the thing and therefore we see it clearly and we can't possibly turn it, be turned away from it and therefore we must act upon it because he has this internal volitionist kind of thing. Whatever is good or true is, is what we will move towards eventually. And I think that's exactly what's going on. And you could compare it to something mathematically, like you can't forget that three plus three plus six. And even if you took a more or sort of softer example and said, well, what about a carpenter? He has a knowledge of how to make a house, right? Surely he could make a bad house, but he could only make the bad house if he had bad materials and certain um, situation around him was poor, like maybe he was in a rush or maybe he didn't have finances and money. They're, they're contingencies. The fact is he has the knowledge, ideally, of how to build a house. So if he had the best of all scenarios, he would, of course, produce a house. And I think that's exactly what's going on. Yeah, I think you're right, Courtney. And in fact, Gorgias agrees with that. You know, he says, 
Well, apparently so. And so Socrates can go to the conclusion, therefore an orator will never want to do what's unjust. But then that uh, brings up earlier what Gorgias had uh, said about, well, what if a, you know, someone who learns martial arts and then does the wrong thing, you don't blame the martial arts teacher. Well, Socrates is not going to let him off on that. He's going to say, well, how is it then that you've made this analogy when we just agreed that an orator wouldn't act badly with their knowledge that they have? Um, but now it appears this very man, the orator, would never have done what's unjust, doesn't it? Uh, so Gorgias, again, has to admit, well, yes, it does seem like that way. Uh, did you did you notice a difference between Gorgias and Polis? Like, Polis is younger, right? And, and he seems... Uh, he seems to be... Uh, from what from what I read, he, he seems to be using it uh, to his advantage. More. Uh, I'm not too sure if you got if you got that as well. Well, Polis is meant to be young, impulsive, you know, bullet a gate. Um, apparently, he's already written a treatise on something or on oratory. I think so. You know, he obviously thinks he knows what he's talking about, and he knows they thinks he knows he's good in argument. But yeah, he's meant to be kind of a bit all over the place and not very disciplined. Um, and and uh, Gorgias is, is the kind of the polished professional by comparison. So Polis is, the, um, Polis is the guy who just got out of Big Brother and he's just about to start a career as an influencer. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, it's such a, it's such a TikTok gen thing to, to be, you know, and I think that if we translate um, Topethan as, as influencing, I kind of think it cuts right through. You know, that's exactly what so many people see as, as a career, is, is influencing people. It's like, oh, okay. I, hope, I hope some Gen Xers watch this in playback because they'll totally get it. Be like, oh, that's yeah. <laughs> <Makes sense. laughs> so, yeah, then, um, Paul, as you say, Carl, Polis inserts himself um, into the discourse. Sorry. Yeah, you notice where, where Polis uh, says it, it's experience that causes our times to march along the way of craft, uh, whereas inexperience causes them to march along the way of chance. Uh, so experience is like, uh, I don't know, the, the Greek is like, in, in, it's like in, empiric, empirical. Um, Something like that, Imperia, Imperia. So, so, so it's like things learnt by by doing. Sorry, is is the speech trial to, and error? Are you talking about the speech towards the end of page eight hundred five? Uh, I'm talking about seven ninety four, page seven ninety four. Oh, okay, we're going back a bit. What you that word you use, Kyle? Imperia. I actually found that too because I used Chatbot to describe what, um, or Chat GPT. It told me that NAC translates to Imperia, so that's what you're talking about. And Imperia is basically what NAC. That's NAC. When he talks about NAC, which is just about to come up, that's the word apparently in the Greek. <clears throat> well, I suppose. Yeah. I suppose it's related. It's the same thing. It's the translation. They, they it, so it, it's what kind you of said. learning by doing. Yeah, learning exactly. by doing. So yeah. I suppose knack is. The so name. the knack is like practical know-how. It's something yeah. that you just pick up by doing it. Yeah. So yeah. well, that takes us to the next section, which is, um, and yeah, Paulus has sort of taken on the um, role of. <laughs> he's kind of inserted himself and taken over from Gorgias in a sense. I think he feels a bit bad for Gorgias. And so he feels he's got to take over. Um, and so then, yeah, so on the next page, which is 806 um, and section 462 of the... It's interesting that you mentioned... You know you mentioned Chariphon earlier as, um, as, as Socrates' um, fanboy? 
Yep. Well, clearly here, Paul is, is, is Gorgias's fanboy. Well, Tiddy, that's right. Chiron doesn't jump in. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and what's interesting, sort of a meta point really, is how interesting how all these um, celebrities have their own fanboys. But, but you also know that, well, that's exactly how it is. You know, wish I had a dollar for every time I've heard a fanboy online of, of one, uh, one or another of the modern Stoics. <laughs> anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> But, yeah, so um, uh, Polis and Socrates are now coming to about, well, what, what, is, what does Socrates actually, Socrates actually think that, uh, that is at stake here? And uh, Polis really puts him on the spot. You know, Polis is put, far more aggressive in, in debate than Gorgias is. Uh, Socrates says, are you asking me what craft I say it is? This is what Gorgias does. And here we get to a key point in the dialogue. To tell you the truth, Polis, I don't think it's a craft at all. Uh, and so Socrates says, in the treatise that I read recently, it's a thing that you say has produced craft. Now, that's kind of an obscure sentence, and there's a bit of a textual point about that apparently, so it's maybe a bit obscure in the Greek. But then, yeah, Socrates says, I'm in a knack, and, and uh, the footnote tells us that's empiria. Um, so yes, yeah, what you what you learn by doing it, whether it's um, whether you learn you know leg spin bowling or uh, or you know a, a strong backhand in tennis or whatever, these are the things that you learn by doing it. But also, Socrates says that the, that it's done for a certain gratification and pleasure, which is interesting. And so, Polus is nothing you know he's nothing loath. He says. Don't you think that oratory is an admirable thing then to be able to give gratification to people? Um, and so then we get to Socrates' very interesting analogy. And this is a really kind of um, curious and technical section, but he's, he likens uh, oratory to pastry baking, patisserie. patisserie. <laughs> wait, 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 just a second before we get to that. I just want to make a note because I I like this sort of stuff. Um, is as this is happening, or just before this, when Polus enters, we see that Gorgias kind of fades out. Right, he's in the background now, and it's Socrates' turn to be examined. He's the one who's going to be cross-examined. And what happens though is though Polus is aggressive, like you said, and and runs straight in. Socrates still makes him obey the rules of discussion. He's, he, and, and, and this becomes really relevant because he'll often tell him he's, he's not doing it properly from this point on, right? I, I'm not jumping ahead, am I? That's, no, that's I think the section. not. That's section. Yeah, and so basically just before they get to the pastry making, for example, Polus um, says, well, no, Socrates says, for example, you know, a knack is an activity that produces gratification and pleasure. And Polus is like, yeah, gratification is awesome, right? And he's like, stop, Polus. You're assuming that I like gratification. Like, you're not doing the discussion properly. And so he keeps trying to bring him back to the way that the dialectic should work, which is really interesting because, you know, we saw how effective it was for Socrates to have the rules in place when he was dealing with Gorgias and he definitely makes sure he still has the same rules even though it looks like he's the one on the back foot getting questioned he's the one who's guiding the structure of the discussion yeah, yeah and um uh and also Socrates makes the point that he doesn't want and he doesn't want Gorgias to think that they're satirizing what Gorgias does, which is kind of interesting because it's going to actually look like that. It's really going to look like that. But Socrates wants to, I think he's, I think he's, what you said earlier, Courtney, he's, he's trying to stress that he's actually sincere. He's not doing this in a spirit of satire or just trying to make a point or just trying to be a pain in the neck, basically. You know, it is in the spirit of finding out the truth and not just um, making holding Gorgias up as some kind of, you know, uh, uh, holding him up for ridicule, really. And Gorgias, to his credit, says, 
say it and don't spare my feelings. You know, he's, he's enough of a, he's got enough confidence in his status, his reputation. Uh, yeah, he's, he's happy to go along with this. And it's going to get quite, it's going to get quite hard. It's going to get quite um, unpleasant, <laughs> essentially. And this is where the polymer will come up here. It's going to come in. It's, it's not going to be nice. Um, so why does Socrates say it's like patisri? Um, and, and he has quite a complex uh, argument here. And, and I, ha I can't say I've thought it through completely. I haven't because it is quite complex, and nor have I read any kind of useful commentary about it either, I might say. But he's saying there are four parts and they're directed to four objects. So if Paul just wants to discover them, let him do so. Uh, if, if, however, you do want to discover this, ask me what sort of part of flattery I say oratory is. Mm -hmm. So the Greek word is kolakeia, which is a, a, a sort of a well-known term in, in uh, Greek and, and for, for Athenian Greek at this time, you know, flattery, kolakeia is, is a bad thing. You know, it's, 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 not a, it's not a positive kind of term. So by saying that oratory is part of kolakeia, Socrates is making a strong point that it's not a good, not necessarily a good thing at all. But, you so, know, sorry. Um, I'll just very quickly, I'll just say, and that's why yeah. Paul says, well, are you saying it's something admirable or shameful? He's trying to pin down exactly what Socrates is getting at there. Yes. Um, so my whole thinking about this, coming at it as a novice, of course, which maybe gives me a fresh, fresh approach, I guess, is I thought he was saying something like, um, you know, he says there's a practice and it's not like a craft at all. Um, but but oratory is the kind of thing that a mind given to making hunches takes to. A mind that's naturally clever at dealing with people. I call it flattery, basically. And then he says there's four different kinds of flattery or four parts to flattery. And flattery, like you say, is a bad thing because what it actually does is pretend to be something useful. So it's the appearance of something or the, the misrepresentation of something that stands in and poses itself as if, it, as if it were the thing. And it does it in such a way as it's persuasive. And if anybody were to follow the flattery that appeals to the senses, for example, they would totally be misled and they wouldn't gain the benefit of having the actual craft or the, the you know, the which is good. And, and, and that's how I understood all that. And it is interesting because we wouldn't relate to it now, probably, but I guess we could. When you think of cookie or cook, cooking or pastry baking or fancy cooking, you know, that degustun or whatever they call it. I, I don't know what it's called. But that, that idea of that food, you know, if it were a craft, would be like the food is healthy and nutritious and it has balance in it and and, and as a result, it, it makes a person healthy and strong. Whereas pastry baking as a form of flattery has the appearance of uh, it does something to the food that the food was unintended to do. It transforms it into something that has to look a certain way or taste a certain way and it has nothing to do with the health benefits or the actual purpose of the food, um, ideally, you know, what it should be. And the same with oratory and the same with cosmetics and the same with sophistry. And I was thinking about, again, how you might apply what I was saying earlier about, um, you know, that postmodern critique of, this, of the psychological disciplines. That would fall into the sophistry category where... Yeah. Uh, and and especially I think because it becomes related to legislation, I think, and and so, yeah, oratory is more related to justice in the sense of uh, oh I can't remember oh justice yeah that's right justice but sophistry is more related to the the legislation I think. And, and so what happens there is that people who are sophists can create systems of conduct that appear to be serving the health of the body, as in the political body, 
but what they've actually done is merely create an appearance to serve the needs of the status quo. And this is literally the argument that that people like Foucault or you know those post-structuralist um, critiques of of the side disciplines do is they look at things like um, the psychiatric handbook um, for diagnosing um, mental illness as just a form of sophistry, like a sophistry textbook for for um, transforming human beings or human suffering or human difficult people into something that they can classify scientifically and then deal with under the guise of acceptable you know um, treatment or whatever but they argue there's no basis for it it's not based on the kind of truth that socrates is demanding for example it's the, the same kind of uh flattery or kind of fake science yeah, exp experience this. kind of convenience essentially yes yeah. yes yeah. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely right, Courtney. It's such an interesting passage, and as I say, I haven't thought it through in detail, but, you know, it brings up the idea of this... Um, uh, he, Socrates says that, um, say, um, cosmet, you know, beauty, beauty as a commodity. I um, can't remember the Greek, what the Greek word is, but, you know, uh, it's translated as cosmetics, I think, or something like that. Basically, these things are... Um, knockoffs or deep fakes or artifacts or or imitations of the real thing so um, cosmetics can be a um, or beauty beauty therapy can be a a knockoff or a deep fake of actual the actual transformation that comes about by serious gym work he even uses that example it's like yeah totally you know um, and and he's making this whole point about Deep fakes, you know, things that are things that are um, purporting to be something, but are in fact something else. And this is such a serious point about culture. I think, <laughs> you know, this yeah. too. Like the influencer is exactly the kind of modern person who would say, okay, go to the gym for five minutes every day and take some photos, but then don't waste your time. You got the money, you got the followers. Just go down to the chop shop and get some. Um, yep. fake surgery yeah packs inserted yep. and get a facelift and a tummy tuck and and you'll be right you know that's the kind of thing that's going yeah. on there it's a hundred percent what he's talking about it's like it's so relevant <laughs> you know and and the interesting thing and this is why stoicism is interesting is because in a way we've kind of come back more to this maybe kind of the way that plato's framing it in that he's really interested or concerned about the the body of politics, the, the, what do you call that? The the soul mm. of the city, basically, the, the group of people, um, the citizens. But the Stoics, on the other hand, will move away more, I think, a little bit from this concern of flattery being, for example, around institutions and craft-like practices, and instead will be interested in the kind of distortions and false impressions that, that, people give to each other especially people in power who have the power to kind of shape um you know what is appropriate and what is not appropriate so it becomes internal if you know what i mean as opposed to these kind of institutional things that that um, socrates is interested in and i think that's really interesting because obviously for notes this if you remember in that technologies of the self he was saying there's a movement from the pol political and, and all that, um, the techniques of shaping are around making the political body healthy. And then there's a movement through the Hellenistic period into it being internalized to a shaping of the self as an internal, you know, willing, perceiving thing or whatever. And then later on with the Christians, there's a movement even further from that to this construction of identity that has to fully disclose itself and tell the truth to a master, which is the invention of sin and so on and so forth. And I just think this idea of flattery and false impression and all that is all tied into this conversation. You know, it's really interesting. Sorry for going on so long about it. No, that's right. Hi, Shannon. Glad you could join us. <laughs> Hello. Shannon, you just missed me having a rant. Uh, 
I pre I, I'm pretty sure I can work it out. It was stoicism good. This aligns with stoicism. Therefore, this part of the text is good. Is that a is that a fair summary? Not really. <laughs> oh. We were just talking about deep fakes, and you know, um, oh. how 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 can you tell the genuine? Um, wh what's genuinely good for the person, or what's just cosmetic? Yeah, because I was thinking about this, like, um, yeah, so I might be jumping back to what you guys spoke about before, but like this whole idea of persuasion, these two two separate ideas of persuasion. You have one that's lacking knowledge and the one that's with knowledge. And I was thinking of it like in terms of a salesperson, like that seems like a very rhetorical heavy role, role that we have. And you could have someone who like does not care about the product at all, but they understand the wording to say about it. But that could actually give knowledge to the customer and it could actually be helpful in a, in a good way. Like it actually gives them a product and they're like, yeah, like this, this fulfills the need that we actually have, but it's not just um, this like getting them to buy it, but it's actually like, oh, like this actually will help me out. But for the sale, from the salesperson's perspective, they're just sort of engaging in like empty rhetoric. Our paradigm is um, the modern influencer. You know, we're thinking of the guy who just got out of Big Brother and he's looking for a new career. That's Polis. Yeah, he missed out. Oh, yeah. Time. <laughs> but yeah, I kind of yeah. I mean, it. You're sounding a little bit corporate there, Shannon, with your idea that maybe it's um, maybe that yeah. <laughs> But that's your background. I get that. <laughs> but even if you take the salesman, Shannon, um, Socrates has already established that the orator or the salesman or the influencer isn't dealing with knowledge. He's dealing with conviction. His job is to inspire conviction in people, and that can be true or false. And even if it's true, later on he'll establish there's such things as true opinion, and they're not the same thing as, as knowledge. But that's in another dialogue, I think. Ah, uh, Okay. Yeah, because I thought like that distinction was a bit um, odd. Like to me, it just feels like the um, the orator can like sort of exist in both in both those spaces, and I find it weird like that uh, Gorgias sort of just accepts it. Like, oh yeah, no, like the empty one. That's that's what represents me. Um, yeah, but maybe that's because it is. Like, you know, that's because he kind of he's happy to take that on. <laughs> He's he's so he's so yeah. he's so established. He's kind of yeah, well yeah, that is me really. But but he falls into it right because what happened if you remember is he says, "I can convince crowds of people," and he and Socrates says, "Well, surely you don't have time to convince everybody. You can't teach everybody, you know, what you want to to show them." So you, what do you do? They either already know or you just persuade them. And he's like, well, yeah, I persuade them. And that's my job. So he's not saying he actually gives people knowledge. He's just saying that's what I do. I persuade people. And that sets him up for all sorts of problems that so Socrates will exploit. So um, Shannon, just to fill you in, Courtney's given a good account of um, where we, we're kind of up to page 808. And so... Socrates yeah. has got this kind of really quite complex setup to do with um, he's got you know that uh, where the body the body a body has two relevant disciplines which is gymnastics and medicine and in politics the counterpart of gymnastics is legislation uh, and the part that corresponds to medicine is justice so that's kind of complex to begin with. Um, and then he's got this idea about flattery, which is in Greek, kolakeia. It's kind of, I suppose, empty gratification. You know, there's, it's pleasing, but with no kind of substance to it. So, and that's where you've, you've got this analogy of the um, patisserie, because, you know, um, if you go on a master chef and you see these amazing desserts people make, they're all very beautiful and they might taste, well, you know, they're going to taste sweet, but they've got no nutritional value whatsoever. And, and that's uh, the analogy to oratory. You know, if, if any, Socrates gives this 
<laughs> this um, uh, sort of big image. If, if, you, if we ask children to judge between what a doctor provides and what the patisserie uh, patis patissia produces, obviously they're going to go 100% to the patissia because they love the desserts, they love the sweet stuff, and the doctor's going to die of starvation, as he points out. <laughs> but, but that's the kind of, but that's what he's calling flattery. It's the empty, empty gratification. Yeah, and, and quickly, I just want to say, he says that um, that flattery is an, the, is an image of a part of politics. That's what he's talking about. And that's an interesting idea because an image of something is not a thing in itself. So you can't feel yourself and get healthy on an image. An image is just like a cardboard cutout, right? It's, it's fake. And, and so it will never really satisfy... And what this is going in the direction of, I would suggest, is it will never make you healthy. It will never make you better. It will never make you stronger. And he will continue to use words throughout this. I wonder what the Greek is, but you've got words like fitness. You've got care several times. And the subjects of body and soul, he says those two things, gymnastics and medicine, come under the category of care of the body, which we could then assume it's correlate, politics, is going to be care of the soul. So again, we see that interpretation that Foucault makes about care of the soul as having priority instead of know thyself. I think it's all through this this part of the of the dialogue. Yeah, the, well, you notice in, in the in the first uh, in the first paragraph just about um, there's a. Uh, Yeah, I've, I've got the I've got the uh, I've got the version in uh, oh, don't worry about it. <laughs> now, have you got the Greek there, Carl? Because I don't have the Greek up. The Greek. All right. Um, yeah, where it, where it says like it's on. Page two, it says, uh, that's no problem, Socrates. I'll make up for it too. And, um, in the in the um, in the version in uh, Perse Perseus, it, it says, I. Oh, I'll take the curing of it too for Gorgias as a friend of mine. All right. It's not, it's not making a lot of sense, but, but the word is, is, is to heal. Um, what, which bit are we, which bit are we at? Oh, the very first uh, paragraph. So, Talking about at, uh, 447B. Oh, okay, way back there. We're down at 464 now. Oh. Yeah, I know. But um, no, I'm thinking if if that's, uh, you know, if that sets a kind of, you know, <laughs> I don't well, know. I'm, looking... I'm right about it, eh? <laughs> that's that's fine. You're good at writing. I think about I'm better it. at that. But um, you Maybe. know, <laughs> I don't know. Did you guys notice though that a care is the theme because flattery throughout this whole section is about something that produces pleasure and gratific gratification, um, and it says it just copies um, for flattery's sake. But obviously, all these other things that are crafts. Have, have very little to do with pleasure and gratification. They're there because they provide care and they and they they nurture and uh, support the, the the body, either the body or either the soul. And he, I think, it says there's a quote here. Whether it must be from the text, they always provide care. He's talking about. Um, anyway, he says. Oh, yeah, he's talking about oh, yeah, gymnastics, yeah. Yeah. gymnastics and medicine. He says those those things always provide care in the one case for the body, in the other for the soul. 
so oh yeah with a view to what's best so as opposed to obviously what one sees fit or suits his desire or his pleasure his gratification instead those things mentioned those um crafts gymnastics medicine legislation and justice they always provide care that's what the text says yeah and so at the end of page 808 there and he kind of Socrates makes clear or sort of sums up what he's saying I say that is it isn't and he means oratory it isn't a craft but a knack because it has no account of the nature of whatever things it applies by which it applies them so it's unable to state the cause of each thing and I refuse to call anything that lacks such an account a craft so it it in Socrates' view, oratory has no kind of backstory or no body of knowledge that leads to, to what it um, leads to in the background of what it's doing. And so that's really interesting, I think. Um, if you have any quarrels with these claims, I'm willing to submit them for discussion. So he's putting it out there. Um, so, and, and he's, you know, I think it's a really interesting um, standpoint that he outlines here and I haven't really thought it through because you know this was one of the as I was saying to Courtney I think before the rest of it everyone came online I read the Gorgias last maybe 15 years ago I obviously completely overlooked this section which is really complex and I think really important so I haven't really kind of thought thought through this section about you know the body politic and the soul politic the role of oratory the role of justice, the role of medicine, the role of gymnastics, the role of cosmetics, the role of pastry cooking. You know, these, these are all things that Socrates is bringing in here. And it's actually really complex. Um, and I think it, it deserves, a, a, you know, it deserves a lot more time than we can probably give it here. But as he concludes, uh, he says, so that I won't make a long style speech. And that comes back to this idea that, you know, he doesn't really want to going for the whole oratory thing. I'm willing to put it to you the way the geometers do, but perhaps you follow me now, that what gymnastics is to, sorry, that what cosmetics is to gymnastics, pastry baking, patisserie, is to medicine, or rather like this, what cosmetics is to gymnastics, sophistry is to legislation, and what pastry baking, patisserie is to medicine, oratory is to justice. So he's making these complex analogies, but the point is, the final point is that the relationship between what Gorgias does, his oratory, um, to actual justice, which is what we hope is actually happening in the law courts and the decision-making of government, is as a kind of superficial, content-free form of gratification without the substance of um, whatever issues are at stake. Yeah, hundred percent. Oratory is an image of justice, completely empty. Sophistry is an image of legislation, completely empty. Cosmetics is an image of gymnastics and empty. And pastry baking is just an image of medicine. It fakes it all the way. And all that stuff's really relevant today. Like are absolutely the things, are the things that support our institutions based on on anything real, and they ought to be. Or are they run by people who are, are just pretending and making shit up as they go along? That's that's the concern. And if it is, and if we accept that as a people, then it's going to ruin the state of our soul, as in as a body of people, it's going to slowly degrade us. Yeah. Well, talking of gratification. Yeah, he's also... Um, saying who's who's to judge like uh, you know a, a doctor or a, or a pastry maker um, bef before men just as foolish as children uh, you know yeah I, I just want to make the point about um, gratification so in my state in New South Wales we're entering an election cycle there's a state election in March and the only thing that um, the government and the opposition are doing is trying to afford gratification in the form of handouts, whether it's for um, a new hospital here or a new childcare centre here or a new um, road here or, hi, Thomas. <laughs> so, 
So it's all this, you know, it's, we can even call it a sugar hit of financial. And the um, corruption too. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly right. You know, that's what um, passes for political achievement in our context, which is kind of horrifying. And, and you, buy, you buy the vote, basically. Yep. And it, it points to exactly what Socrates is talking about. You know, this is a this is a simulacrum. This is a this is a deep fake of actual governing. It's sh throwing out sugar in the form of financial incentives. It's not unexpected though, because we've <laughs> no. always <laughs> correct. That's right. Yeah. It's been going on for um two and a half thousand years, obviously. But yeah, it's yeah. but I think it's still worth um pointing to. And and our old friend who used to be in this group who helped start it, the one interested in phenomenology, she um, this is her reason for her dislike of the Stoics, actually. And I think this sort of summarises it because she thinks that this uh, interest of, of uh, Plato's and Socrates is the legitimate use of philosophy. And that's what Socrates is sort of saying. If Gorgias can't, um, provide good answers to these questions who's going to the philosophers right and she said my friend would suggest that that's where the stoics went astray in that they start to move inwards they start to internalize this uh you know and i mean what i'm saying is not necessarily the case but you can definitely see a movement from institutional concerns and in the Stoic taking the same ideas to more um, one's own internal ability to make um, uh, good judgments about perceptual material as opposed to, you know, what's going on necessarily with, with the state of the city or the, the uh, you know, those sorts of things. So some people... Some people think that that's a, a backwards move to to look at the individual ego as opposed to outwards at the, the state of the, the health of society, for example. Well, it depends on depends on what you think your starting point is, really. The, the, the self or something else. Well, part of this would suggest you'd imagine that... Um, the soul, what he's talking about, the, the things that are important aren't so much about the individual soul as they are the soul of the group, you know, the, the, the welfare of the city state, for example. Mm. That the takes group. priority in, in this in this particular form of philosophy. Mm. The group and the and the self uh pretty much the same thing, though, to Stoics, aren't they? Um, let's move on, because we need to move on. <laughs> yeah. So there's actually quite a confusing little exchange between Polis and Socrates coming up, um, and they seem to be kind of sparring, if you like. And then we get to this next kind of... Uh, topic which is about uh, whether people with absolute power which in the classical Greek context was tyrants so absolute um, people who had absolute power in their city-states whether they as Paul suggests um, are doing what they want and so Socrates and Polis go head to head on this issue Courtney, did you want to comment on that part? Oh, just on that. Oh, quickly. sorry. sorry. Um, yeah, because I listened to the audiobook and got up to around here. And that whole thing about power, I found it very odd when they were discussing it. But that, I think, like, with the way you've described it, that it, it, it sounds like as though there was more a negative connotation with power. Like, is that sort of how it would have been understood? Yeah, I think so. So, um the Athenians uh, were kind of unique or you know, nearly unique in, in the Greek city-states in not having any tyrants. And a tyrant was someone who took power for himself uh, and had absolute power and, you know, executed all the people who opposed him or banished them. 
and uh, were rewarded as friends and had absolute power over everybody. So it was it was definitely a negative in in Athenian terms, but it was something they were very familiar with because just about every city state except Athens um, had these you know these tyrants. Are, are you sort of jumped ahead a bit? Are you talking about the Archelaus kind of bit? Or uh, are you still... Well, we we will be because that's the example that Paulus tries to give. So we're in page eight ten. Because what I wanted to say on eight ten is that um, um, Paulus wants to know if Socrates thinks orators have power. That's the question you're asking, right? So Socrates thinks if power means having something good for the one who has, yeah, power means having something good, right, for the one who has power. I think that's really important, right? Is that the thing that you're saying seems a bit strange? What I would suggest is if Foucault's right and Socrates thinks care for the soul is the most important thing, then that that criteria for power makes absolute sense. If power means having something good for the one who has power. So power is pointless if it doesn't do you good, if it doesn't improve your soul in, in some sense. Am I, I have following to, that? I have to say I didn't I haven't got in front of me what I'm assuming the term used for power is dunamis, but I, I'm not sure of that because I haven't looked up the Greek um, on this particular section. Um, and that's something I'll do. But I think um because it's think, around E, isn't it? On eight ten. Yeah, yeah. So e. Socrates is kind of identifying that what it was sort of trying to He's actually trying to trip Polis up and Polis is kind of unwillingly tripped up. Um, but, but he's trying to make this disjunction between power and good. Um, and so, yeah, it was quite an interesting, point, interesting question where Socrates says, do you think it's good then if a person does whatever he sees most fit to do when he lacks intelligence? Do you call this having great power too? which is kind of interesting, but there, he's made this um, link with intelligence. And I, again, I should have looked up the Greek for that section, but I haven't. Um, and so then that Socrates brings it back to this idea about oratory, whether they have intelligence or whether it's a craft and not flattery. Power is a good thing, you say, but you agree with me that doing what one sees fit without intelligence is bad, or don't you? And he knows that Polis is going to agree with him because obviously a young, impulsive, smart guy, which Polis is, is going to think that having intelligence is a good thing. Um, and so at the top of page 811, how then could it be that orators or tyrants have great power in their cities so long as so Socrates is not refuted by Polis to show that they do what they want. So that's a kind of a kind of convoluted um, question. And he's obviously trying to test out Polis here. And the word about the word for refuted is, is this um, the word that we know from Soc Socrates elenchus. It means being um, being proved wrong in argument. And so Socrates says, go ahead and refute me. Um, So the question is, do, do people in this position of complete power uh, go ahead and do what they see fit, but are they doing what they want? And that, you know, then there's the question of what are those two the same things? This is, this is an important section, I think, for that theory of motivation that comes up, especially in the Stoics. So... For example, in the background here, there's this Socratic assumption that everyone wants to be happy or to flourish or whatever you want to call it. And that's what he's talking about, clearly. He says that although they seem to um, do what they want, you know, he's arguing that although they do what seems right or fit, they do not do what they want. So, and what they want is to be happy. Yeah, that's right. And it, yeah, it's all this, this, this idea of what, what it is that they, 
um, what, what they're really aiming for. So Socrates uses the, uses the analogy of when people take medicines, which they may not like doing, and again, that's a reference back to Gorgias' brother, the great, the great doctor who uh, helped by Gorgias with his patients, uh, who don't want to take their medicine, but they take it because they want to be healthy. So people do, do X in order to achieve Y. With um, people who go to C, and often have very difficult voyages, but they don't do it for the sake of having a voyage, they do it to make money. So they do something that's troublesome in order to gain something that's good. Or sometimes they do things um, that are neither good nor bad. And this is, of course, very reminiscent of what's going to come later with the Stoics. Yeah, there's our account of the good, the bad, and indifferent things, right? In 8.11, Socrates says, Now, is there anything that isn't either good or bad, or what is between these, neither good nor bad? Polo says, no. So that covers everything. And things which are neither good nor bad, you mean things which sometimes partake of what's good, sometimes of what's bad, and sometimes of neither, such as, like you said, sitting or walking, running or making sea voyages, or stones and sticks and the like. The intermediate things are done for the sake of the good ones. So they're the that's reason's proper ends. So it's because we pursue what's good that we walk whenever we walk. We suppose that it's better to walk in that case. So we start to see what the Stoics will de develop into a cognitive account of motivation, which is something like the beliefs we have about things cause us to act appropriately or otherwise depending on the knowledge of good and bad and the status of externals which are neither good or bad this is literally what they're talking about here yeah 100 percent. and but but socrates gets polis to think about this kind of decision making in the case of uh, an absolute um, dictator a tyrant hence we don't simply want to slaughter people you know we don't kill them because we want to kill them um, or exile them or confiscate their property. We want to do these things if they're beneficial, but if they're harmful, we don't. Um, so is this, you know, and he tries to get Polis to agree whether this is the decision-making process of someone in that position or not. And Polis says, I think that's true. Um, so since we're in agreement about this, a person who's a tyrant or an orator <laughs> puts somebody to death or exiles him or confiscates his property because he supposes that doing so is better for himself uh, when it actually it's worse, this person. I take it he's doing what he sees fits, so he's doing what he thinks is going to result in the best outcome. And um, then we come to this, cru this crux. Socrates says, and it, is he also doing what he wants if these things are actually bad? Why don't you answer? Polo says, all right, I don't think he's doing what he wants. So this is the, the, the key here. Um, and so that allows Socrates to go on to say, well, maybe he doesn't. How can he be having that great power if he can't do what is right, what is good? Um, and so Socrates concludes, so what I was saying is true, that when I said it is possible for a man who does in his city what he sees fit not to have great power, nor to be doing what he wants. But Polis is, is not prepared to give up that position just yet. As if you wouldn't be envious whenever you'd see anyone putting to death some person he saw fit or confiscating his property or tying him up. <laughs> he really is a bit um, all over the place, our Polis. This is actually like, um, it just sort of clicked, like this dialogue, isn't there a similar one in the Republic? Mm -hmm. Sort of along. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, just made I just had that memory of it that there was a similar sort of argument that was put forward. This is like the short version. Yeah, correct. <laughs> um, so then that brings us to this point of being just or unjust. Um, and then we get to another key element of this dialogue. Um Socrates says, because you're not supposed to envy the unenviable or the miserable, you're supposed to pity them. Paula says, really? Is, that, is this how you think it is with the people I'm talking about? 
They think that person who puts to death anyone he sees fit and does so justly is miserable and to be pitied. Socrates says, no, I don't, but I don't think he's to be envied either. And so this comes to this whole issue, which, of course, is going to be really key in the whole subsequent history of thinking about what it is to suffer unjustly or suffer justly, you know, as we saw in Boethius, this is very important to the whole history of subsequent thought about these issues. You know, whether it's better to suffer unjustly or suffer justly or, to, you know, to, to be the inflictor of suffering or not. So, yeah, did anyone else want to talk about this whole section? Well, it's a very important section. Um, where to start? I think he says we're at about eight fourteen, right? He says about having great power that as long as acting as one sees fit coincides with coincides with acting beneficially, it is good. And this evidently is having great power. Otherwise, it is a bad thing and is having little power. And this is very reminiscent of Boethius. I posted something the other day, as you just mentioned, where he uses the words, I don't know about the Latin translation, but it says powerless power, you know, when he's talking about the the power of the tyrant. He literally is talking about it pretty much the same thing. Um, and that whole section where Polis is... Uh, sort of sarcastic that that's my understanding right when he's using the example of Archelaus he's he takes on a very sarcastic tone with Socrates um and he's like I, I think he's sort of saying what do you mean you you uh of course he's happy and and this is the bit that made me think that uh, Socrates was actually being sincere because he doesn't rise to it he doesn't go oh, fuck off or anything he just he just says, no, I don't make any assumptions about the man's happiness. I, I've got to know a little bit about the man first. I, I, but there's a footnote in the text that says apparently this Persian king was kind of the the, the uh, exemplar of happiness in, in the time. You know? Yeah. But, but, uh, yeah, and the, the whole, I think oh, it's yeah. really interesting. Oh, go ahead, Isabel. Yeah, just as he said, you know, as Socrates said afterwards, like it's one example, you know. So it's um, you know, it's uh, it's always like you you've got a reality, and you always have someone who comes back with the the contrary example because they know that person or that one who is going to just take your argument out of the way. But um, yeah, but I, I you know that was an interesting point there. Yeah. And I think another thing that's going on there is that the footnote is making a point that um, Polis is using an idiom. It's like cultural, culturally accepted that this is the case. But Socrates doesn't fall for the idiom. He just says, no, I don't really um, follow these expressions, you know. Um, I'd have to know case by case whether the man was happy or not. Just um... and, Sorry. Oh, do, do you want to finish that point, Courtney? Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're right. I tend to just keep going on and on. <laughs> so here you go. Um, yes, this is just on 8.13D, um, where it's got uh, uh, where it's got Socrates, well, my wonderful fellow. And he's talking about having the dagger and that that's a form of power. But, like, <clears throat> it kind of does feel like that is a form of power. Now, what, what would make me want to agree with Socrates there is he's saying that's not a great power but then I'm not quite sure like when we're adding on great to power like when I think of that it, that seems like a very high bar uh, to get over um, it yeah, does at the very yeah. least seem like a type of power yeah, I don't I think I don't think it's a power that everybody because like the not necessarily that it's a power that someone should pursue or something like that. It's probably um an unhealthy person who's like, I want to have the power to kill anyone that I see. So I'm going to carry a knife with me. Um it's um a, a very like paranoid way 
of um of looking at things but it is a kind of in in one way it, it is a type it does like it, it would seem odd not to call it a type of power in some sense. Yeah, you see it in film all the time, right? Yeah. To this it, day. And doesn't yeah. this, this foreshadows the might is right argument and also Nietzsche's argument as well that, um, you know, if you are fitter and stronger and all that than everybody else, well, then maybe they should just get out of your way. Then. And, you know, this is Nietzsche's critique of Socrates in a sense. He's like, he would he would have us think that Callicles coming up, I think, it has the probably more appropriate argument, but Socrates misleads us by by causing us to uh, to be honest with ourselves and instead we fly away and run off into these metaphysical realms of morality and stuff and, and do our spirit and our creativity harm as a result and this kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it's a good point, Shannon. I think um, Plato actually kind of skims over that a bit because uh, he, he has Socrates anticipate the objection but Socrates everybody could have great power that way for it this way any house you see fit might be burned down and so might the dockyards and triremes of the Athenians and all their ships both public and private well yeah and that's exactly what we you know that's what we call terrorism today it's it's certainly a form of power so yeah, yeah. and it is and it is something that like in the, theoretically like it uh, everyone can have it but it requires a certain um drivenness like uh a sort of like goal in mind like um and i don't mean like obviously it's not a positive thing to have but like it, yeah it, it, it does yeah. seem like where does the goal come from? yeah well there, there's like multiple reasons for terrorism which is probably a good idea to avoid the the, the causes of that but like yeah but have, other, like, other things like criminal uh behavior you know criminal uh you know just just being a, being a part of organized crime or something like that you know, yeah the uh the examples uh in film and in in the uh day-to-day -day activity right um i'm suggesting we kind of move on because I was matching on. I just wanted to um, point to what I think Courtney raised earlier on page 815, the, where Polis gives this kind of detailed biography of Archelaus and all the horrendous things he's done in order to achieve and retain power. And basically he's killed members of his own family. Um, he's, he's just this, you know, and, and I guess it does get us to think about people in that position and... You know, in the news today, we see, you know, there's certainly people, dictators in different countries who have uh, attained and retained power through this kind of <laughs> this kind of activity. And it gets us to think, well, are these people mm. happy? Are they satisfied with their lives? Or, or are they not? And this is like what so Socrates wants us to get us to think about. Yeah. I, I think that... They're pursuing some sort of fulfillment, which well, is analogous to what happiness is yeah, thought I, to be. Yeah, I, I think when you want power and, and stuff like that, it doesn't matter um, what your fulfillment is. It's just that you always want more. It's like an addiction. You know, it's like playing, gambling, you know, in, you know, drinking or whatever. You know, like when you want power, it's always you want more. Otherwise, you're satisfied by your own little power that you have, you know, um, around of being able just to whatever, you know, power in your life, freedom, I suppose, and, and your power. But I, I think people at the top there, they were mad after a couple of years, if they're not before. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think you're right, Isabel. I mean, he uses a medical analogy frequently, and it's like the people in power are addicted to it, and it never satisfies them, never fills them up. So it it, it never acts um, as nature should to satisfy or to finish something off, you know what I mean? Like, uh, it doesn't have an end. And they, they tend to believe themselves 
to be perfectly reasonable because reason is within scope, right? Yeah, but the medical analogy, as I was going going with that, is is kind of the idea that uh, power, like Socrates says, has to be good for you. That's part of his definition. So it's not power if it's not good for you. I know it's a funny one, but if you enter this um, thinking, and again, I keep saying the care of the soul, if you're thinking about what is good for you, and that's Socrates' whole thing, is anything other than that is a movement away from what is actually what human beings want because they want to be healthy, they want to be happy, they want to be flourishing. Anything that leads in the opposite direction from that can't possibly be power and it can't possibly be healthy, which seems to be what he's going about. So that brings us to this um, question about punishment, and this is, again, one of the really key elements of the dialogue. Uh, so if somebody who, and Socrates puts this forward, that somebody who's uh, done the wrong thing or done some crime and then is punished, is it going to be more miserable, more unhappy in view of the punishment or less unhappy in view of the punishment? And Polis uh, maintains that it's quite that's quite an absurd position that somebody who's punished is better off than someone who isn't punished for their crimes. But this is what they're going to disagree about. Um, so on page 817, Polis gives the example of someone. Take a man who's caught doing something unjust, say plotting to set himself up as a tyrant. Because he's caught, put on the rack, castrated, and has his eyes burned out, all these tortures. Um, and then is he going is he going to be better off than someone who's um, taken power in that way, become a ruler, and you know, ruled over his citizens and not received any punishment whatsoever? And Socrates, counterintuitively, suggests that um, punishment is better off for the perpetrator. So what do we think about that idea? It's interesting, like a, a punitive sense of justice, where if you actually took this to, or if, if, two factors, if you take punitive justice as like causing punishment and pain um, to the person that's done the wrong, as a uh, requirement of legal justice, then if it's actually good for the person, it's sort of, um, in some way, it, it actually changes the idea of punishment. Of like, then, if you follow that to its um, logical conclusion, um, I don't really have a point beyond that. It was just something I was thinking of as, as you were talking about it. Yeah, but we have to think about, well, what is the point of incarceration or other forms of legal punishment? Yeah, I think it's something that, um, like, I've read thing. oh, like, this is years ago now, but, like, about prison abolition and, and that sort of thing. Um, and there's some part of me that does see that point because it, it is kind of weird um, when it's just punitive of, like, let's, let's just cause them as much suffering as possible. Um, but, yeah, and it's sort of just... I don't even know whether that would actually bring satisfaction for the actual people who have been wronged. Like, it seems like it's more of a social satisfaction of, like, uh, you see this a lot um, with, like, uh, when people talk about pedophiles. Like, there's this strong need to, for lack of a better word, virtue signal about um, them being killed. They must suffer. They must must have all this pain. And it's just very virtue signally. At least, like, that's that's my view on it. Um, and, and like that does seem like an unhealthy way to view to view justice, but probably yeah. an honest emotion. For me, I was uh, uh, when when I read that, I was thinking of a, uh, you know, like in France during the time of um, Hitler with the Jews and family who actually protected Jews, you know, and risked their life and. And I was always, I mean, not always, but a few times I've, I've asked myself, you know, like, what would have I done? 
you know, would have I actually done the right thing and maybe received the suffering, even though it's unjust and, and accept it, you know, or try to protect my family and do something which is terrible and, and let them go past their way type of thing because the suffering would be too great compared to the goodness that I would have to do. So it's, and, and, and to be honest, I'm there just, my answer is that I always think that I hope I would have helped, <laughs> but in the end, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know because, you know, like you, you are not really in that situation to be able to, you know, I still hope that I would have, but <laughs> But, you know, like the suffering, the right and wrong and stuff like that, there is the difference between being a philosopher and just saying, yes, for sure, you know, you do the right thing and yes, I take the suffering or whatever. But in the reality of, of things, you know, it's it's um, it's different. The theory. <laughs> it's a tough one. I agree with you, Isabel. I, if I was honest, I probably wouldn't have helped those people. <laughs> but, but no, you I... don't know either. That's the thing. Is that <laughs> either you might have been, you know, in yeah. that situation and realizing, you know, so all, all the things to realize but that, at that time, you know. But, and uh, and that's why I think Socrates is really going against what is conventional in our own nature, in a sense. Well, in our social kind of the way we talk about things, because what he's actually saying is, if you have the perspective that doing the right thing was good for you, then you would do what is right because it's good for you even if getting punished was good for you you'd go for it and he uses the medical analogy again right he says if you were a grown-up and you're rational and you realized you had a disease you'd go to the doctor and he would give you the horrible things that you needed in order to get well so you'd have surgery or whatever you'd put up with the uncomfortableness and the pain or whatever is required in order to get better and he says the man who avoids the the punishment, the the just punishment, and and refuses to pay his dues is a bit like the person who avoids getting the the treatment from the doctor. He's not actually doing himself any favors in the long run. He's actually making his condition worse. That that's as long as you know what's good for you. But see, this is the point with Socrates. I think it's an ethical philosophy through and through. It's all about what is good for you. It's that, that's it. If we approach it like scientists and, and forget about that dimension, then the whole argument falls apart. It's like, well, why would you do that? I would do the selfish thing. You know, but it only but, makes sense from that perspective. Actually, for me, if I can, I'd finish with a, a sentence that uh, Socrates wrote and um, which um, say what we with there. I don't suppose there is anything quite so bad for a person as having false belief. Because when you have really false belief and then you are a good uh, or orator <laughs> and you can uh, and you can uh, you know be a good persuasive person, you are extremely powerful and strong. You know, and and that's that's the people who are really dangerous are people with false belief because they believe they're doing the right thing. And that's the most dangerous thing. So it's it's really being, you know, so yes, so um, false beliefs for Socrates, Socrates, I think that's, um, that's really bad. <laughs> that's my conclusion for my reading today. <laughs> yeah, just on that, uh, what Cody was saying around that medicine thing, but like when we look at like how prison systems have worked, like they aren't this, objective carefully calculated um system of punishment like things are weighed um and perhaps naively i think it's it's not as bad as it has been in the past but things used to be very much weighed on um class lines like the way punishment was dealt out so it doesn't it like in terms of like practical like real world things um, it seems like you could go, okay, well, I accept this, that if I was punished justly, then I should accept it. But if you don't, um, and whether or not you do is, is irrelevant, but if you don't think you live in a just society where you are going to be punished justly, and in a way that is actually going to be the medicine, um, to use that analogy, like, then it would seem it's better to become the tyrant. <laughs> Yeah. In that case, that, that would probably align with most of the world at most points in time. 
Yeah, but then we've got to recall that um, in Socrates' own case, the city made the judgment that he would be put to death and he went along with it because mm. he loved the city and and accepted that above everything else. So, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. It, it, well, ho hopefully if he was 20 years old at the time, he would have fled though. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it, it it should get us to think about what is the purpose of criminal justice, essentially. I mean, and and throughout the ages, it has tried to, you know, it has prompted people to think about what the purpose of criminal justice has been. So, for instance, in the middle of the 18th century, when um, in England, a huge range of offences attracted the death penalty, um, and people were turning around and saying, well, this is horrendous. What can we do about it? And first of all, then you know, convicts were sent to America, and then, <laughs> and then, um, fortuitously, from 1788 onwards, they were sent here, essentially because there was a deep debate in the culture around what is the appropriate punishment for people, and and what are we trying to achieve by pun by criminal justice? And I think, you know, this this passage in in Plato should get us to think about that, among other things. I agree. And, you know, the interesting thing here is I think that's super important and that's probably exactly what Plato had in mind. But again, it's interesting how it seems that Epictetus picked it up because it sounds just like their physicalist description of the way impressions work. She basically says, you know, if something... He gives it just like the definition of bodies. He says, if one thing moves, it's because its movement is caused by another thing, right? And it, and he says, so which one would you say is the person who pays the the uh, fine or pays what's due? And Paul says, well, he's the one acted upon. So you get this thing of this affecting that kind of thing, this causality. And he says... And so is the one who dispenses justice good? And they're like, yeah. And he and he then dispenses justice on the onto this guy who's paying his dues. And he's like, yeah. So then therefore the just guy is doing the good thing to the guy who needs to pay up, and therefore a good thing is done to him. And he's like, Yeah. <laughs> you know, so there's this chain reaction kind of thing that the good carries along. And therefore. A good thing has been done to him. It's beneficial. It makes him better, and therefore, it's good for him to be punished. It's very much like the the Stoic idea of uh, that one thing strikes another thing, and and that's how that's how um, basically everything in the world works or moves. Well, that's probably a good place to end tonight because we've run over time, but. <laughs> <laughs> because essentially the entire English justice system involved the death penalty in the middle of the 18th century and because Britain was um, in a geostrategic struggle with France for the new colonies, um, that's in a sense why we're here because, <laughs> because of a um, particular form of the criminal justice system. So um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think what's difficult is that the victim, they, they want the person who has been you know, doing doing the wrong thing. They they want them to suffer because they're suffering. So uh, uh, you know, so you can understand that. But if if you look at it as a society, hurting someone more, you know, especially if it's a young person, instead of re-educating and helping them to be more confident and integrated in the society or whatever. So as a whole for the society, it's better to look after them better, which is hard to take for the victim because you want them to be punished. So it, it's a, it's a contradictory um, emotions, you know, on both sides. Um, and it's a difficult one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very difficult. And yeah, I mean, we could we could talk at some length about criminal justice and, and what we're trying yeah. to achieve, yeah, what we're trying to achieve <laughs> with a criminal justice system. But suffice to say for now, that Socrates thinks that the uh, criminal who has undergone punishment has undergone a benefit. So that's a good place to, to leave it tonight, I think. Thank you very much, very Judith. Good. Excellent. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. See you. See you soon. And see you see later. You. Bye. Bye.
see it. 